Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to show you how I painted these 15mm scale American infantry for Flames of War. As the title of the video suggests, these are the infantry from the Grimble's Beast box set. I built all of the models from that box set last year. If you want to see the build video of these infantry models, you can click the video on screen now. A link to the playlist of all the Grimball's Beasts videos is in the video description and will also include the other painting videos that are coming. Unfortunately, this box set is no longer in production, though I'm sure you could find it on eBay and some retailers may still have it in stock. All of the models should be available separately anyway. The good news is Battlefront have released a new box set, Patton's Eagles, and it does look to be very similar to Grimball's Beasts if not exactly the same. Not only that, but it comes with the rulebook and the Bridget Remagen book, so it really is a better box set. I painted the vehicle crews at the same time as these infantry, just as a time saver, and I would suggest you do the same if you are also painting this box set. I haven't really done an overly complicated paint job for these. I would consider this to be a basic tabletop paint job. In addition, I've probably got quite a few of the colours, if not all of them, wrong. I say wrong in air quotes because, well, I don't really care. I look at some references and do a little bit of research, but I mostly just go with what looks good to my eye. After all, they're my models. If you're looking for super historically accurate colours and painting, you might be in the wrong place. Okay, let's get started. The first thing I did to these was to airbrush the bases brown. I've actually forgotten which brown I used because I'm a bit of a numpty. It's most likely Vallejo Model Air Mahogany and Mud Brown, though it's not really important, it's just brown. Then, to cover that brown on the bases while I do further airbrush layers, I applied Humbrol Maskol. Another liquid masking product could be used instead, but Maskol is what I have, so that's what I used. Maskol shits up brushes good and proper, so be sure to use a cheap throwaway brush. You should always have cheap crappy brushes on hand, they're really useful. Next I start painting the uniform. I airbrush on some AK Interactive M43 Uniform Green Olive. This is from the AK Interactive US Army Soldiers Uniform Colour Set, AK3070. This is the first time that I've used AK Interactive's acrylic paints and I think they're pretty nice. This colour was a little bit thin, so I had to do a couple of coats to properly cover the black primer, but that's not a bad thing at all. When this colour dried, it was very matte and quite nice. I then attempted a highlight by mixing a little bit of model colour buff with the green. I airbrushed this on directly from above. I wasn't entirely satisfied with this. I thought it was a little bit too light, so I resprayed the uniform green olive again, but not so heavily as to completely obscure the highlighting attempt. I think this actually ended up working out okay. I hadn't applied that highlighting to the vehicle's crews, mostly because, well, I forgot. I decided to highlight these with dry brushing. I mixed a tiny bit of Vallejo Model Air white into the uniform green olive and then dry brushed it onto the vehicle crews. I didn't bother with the tanker because he will be painted differently and I wasn't too worried about doing the fronts of the half-track drivers because only their backs will be visible anyway. I probably should have stuck these to the shot glass facing the other way, but oh well. The standing crew figures received the dry brushing on both sides, though they don't really need a lot of attention to their lower halves as they'll be inside the half tracks. This had turned out a little bit more subtle than I had intended, but that's okay. It's only the beginning and there's plenty more to do. I liked how this worked on the vehicle crews, so I applied it to the rest of the infantry too. I then started on the tank commander's jacket. I quickly base coated this with Vallejo Khaki from the old Flames of War branded paints. I'm not sure if it's one that still exists, but this is what I used. I believe this is a fairly accurate colour for the tanker's jacket. I could have used the green ochre khaki from the AK Interactive set, but I liked this one a little bit better. I highlighted this with a fairly rough dry brushing of a mixture of three quarters khaki with one quarter model colour buff. I apply this with downward strokes, attempting to represent light shining down onto the upper surfaces of the model. You can see why I didn't bother to base coat the skin or helmets yet. The result is kind of subtle, which is what I did want, but I figured I might take the highlight a little bit further. So I repeated the process a little bit more gently with plain model colour buff. It might be a little light at the moment, but after the model receives some washes it should darken down a little bit. Next I turn my attention to the trousers of all the shooty mans. I base coat these with AK Interactive US Field Drab. The bottle was mislabeled as US Filed Drab, which I found amusing. I try to avoid getting this colour onto the jackets and parts that need to stay green, but it doesn't really matter if it strays down onto the lower leg gaiter parts. This colour is pretty thin, so I had to apply a couple of coats to get a nice solid covering, but this does save having to thin the paint myself. 
I then applied AK Interactive Green Ochre Khaki to the gaiters. This colour is also pretty thin right out of the bottle, requiring a few coats. I think it's safe to say there's a pattern emerging here. While I had that colour out, I also painted all the entrenching tool covers, belts, pouches, straps and webbing. This can be a little bit fiddly, especially the straps, so I use a fine brush for those obviously. For me, the trick is just to go slowly and carefully. Having all of these things being the same colour looks a little bit boring to me, but that's okay. We could add some variety later with highlights and such, and to be fair, at this scale it isn't all that important. I don't really want to spend too much time painting slightly different colours on pouches that almost nobody would ever notice. Base coating them all in one colour is the easiest way to do it. Next I painted the handles of the shovels. For this I used model colour beige brown. I wasn't sure if this was an entirely accurate colour or if these were even actually made of wood, but I like beige brown for wooden handles, so I went with it. It should be obvious that I was pretty careful to avoid the surrounding areas of uniform when applying this. Now for some more wood, this time the wooden parts of the rifles for which I used Vallejo Model Air Burnt Umber. This is a little bit fiddly to do. I'm not too concerned about getting this colour onto the hands which will be painted later. That makes this step a little bit easier. I am of course trying to be very neat where the gun touches the parts I've already painted. These things can all be fixed later, but it's obviously better to not have to go back and correct mistakes. Next I painted the helmets. I painted these before the straps because I figured it would be easier to paint the strap later than trying to paint around it now. The colour I used on these is Vallejo model colour brown violet. The model colour paints are thicker than the AK interactive ones, so they do need to be thinned down a little bit. Of course if you are painting the vehicle crews at the same time, don't forget to do their helmets too. I didn't bother giving my drivers any webbing, partially because I'm lazy and partially because I didn't see any moulded on them anyway. Now I figured it was a good time to paint more of the weapons. I used Vallejo model colour USA olive drab and painted the mortar, the tripod and ammo case for the machine gun and most most importantly, the bazookas. I chose this Vallejo colour over the AK olive drab from the box set because while they do look pretty similar, I liked the Vallejo version a little bit better. Continuing with the weapons, I painted the metal parts of the rifles and other guns. I figured I might try painting these a little different than I normally do and using a paint I've not used before. I apply Italeri flat gun metal to the metal parts of the guns. This colour came in Italeri's World War II German military set. I don't usually like using metallics for guns, especially at this scale. The result is a nice, kind of dark silvery colour, but obviously way too shiny as you can plainly see. I'm going to darken this down quite a lot with some washes later. I'm pretty happy with how this colour went on and I'll probably use it again in the future. Don't forget to apply this to any pistols, SMGs and machine guns in addition to the rifles. And you definitely want to go slowly and take your time with this when you try to paint near the uniform. It's always a pain in the arse to get metallic colours in places you don't want them. Next I use AK Interactive Red Brown Leather to paint anything that might be, well, leather. That includes rifle straps and helmet straps which are very fiddly little parts to paint. I didn't paint the straps over the top of the helmets at this point because the green on the helmets isn't yet finished. I will probably have to redo a lot of the helmet straps anyway when I do the skin. I also apply this colour to any pistol holsters, though not many of the figures have one of these. The boots also got painted with this red-brown leather. I wasn't really sure if the boots should be black or brown, both options seemed valid. But I liked the red-brown leather a little bit more than black. I do think this is quite a nice colour. These AK Interactive acrylics seem to pretty consistently have a really nice matte finish. I then apply a wash of Army Painter Strong Tone diluted with water, approximately one part Strong Tone to three parts water. I apply this fairly heavily all over the figures. Don't worry too much about dripping it onto the base or anything like that. The Strong Tone didn't do enough to darken down the gun metal, so I used a fine brush to apply straight dark tone to all of the metal parts of the guns. I do this before applying the highlight to the wood parts because I figured it would ruin and obscure the highlights. Doing it this way means I have to worry a little bit less about being neat. This is the same reason and I'm going to paint faces and hands next. I base coat these areas using Vallejo Model Air Skin Tone. This is fairly thin, being a Model Air paint, so I did have to do a couple of coats. I did my best to apply this very carefully to avoid getting the colour anywhere I don't want it, which I guess I have been doing the entire time, but now I'm being even more careful. At this scale, that's pretty tricky and I did make a few mistakes. There's nothing wrong with that and we all make mistakes. The good thing about doing this step now is that I can correct any errors with the skin colours getting on the uniform when I go and highlight the uniform. It's always good to try and minimise the number of corrections you have to make. 
Next, I apply Secret Weapon Drying Blood Wash to all the fleshy bits. There is a specific flesh wash, but I'm not going to use that just yet. I like the more reddy colour this wash has for the base coat. The flesh wash is a little too brownish yellow, and I think the drying blood works better here. It leaves the flesh looking a little bit pink, which I like. You can see there's quite a difference in the skin after this step. Next, I apply the Model Air Skin Tone again. This time, I apply it a bit more like a dry brush, but not quite. I think this technique is called overbrushing, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I apply this fairly gently to most of the raised portions of the flesh, especially on the upper sides of the areas where the sunlight will be hitting them. This allows the pinkish colour underneath to still be visible, mostly in the mouths and around gaps and crevices. You can see what I am doing is especially apparent on that hand there. This pinkish colour in the recesses is kind of subtle, but it is there. At this stage, I think they look a little bit worse than the previous step, which is on the right. But there's still more to go yet. Next, I add a highlight with Vallejo Model Color Light Flesh. I fairly carefully apply this to the tip of the nose, cheekbones and chin, depending on how prominent the model's chin is, and anywhere else that's on the upper surfaces of the skin. It's a pretty basic highlight, really. Because these models are so small, it's not really worth spending too much time and effort going into too much detail with this. You could of course do it a lot quicker and more roughly, but I don't think it's worth too much attention. I follow that highlight with a wash, this time Secret Weapons Flesh Wash. It is diluted two parts water to one part flesh wash. Unsurprisingly, it goes on the fleshy bits. I try to apply this reasonably heavily, but not extremely so. The skin tone is done for now, but it will get more washes later. It is now time for more highlights. I dry brushed the helmets using the same brown violet I base coated them with, but the wash on the helmets didn't quite darken them enough so this doesn't really work very well as a highlight. So I mixed some Model Air White into the brown violet and repeated the dry brush. The mix was about 5 parts brown violet to 1 part white. I also applied a little bit of this to some of the areas on the jackets just to add a little bit of variation and interest, though it's probably not all that noticeable. In doing this I was obviously being very careful to avoid getting this on the guns or flesh. Then I added a little bit more white to the green and repeated the process just a little bit lighter. I try to focus this mostly on the very tops and rims of the helmets. I didn't add any more to the jackets. The result is a little bit more obvious than the previous layer, but not too much so. Personally, I don't normally like extremely obvious highlights. Next, I figured I might as well give the pants a little highlight with the AK Interactive Field Drab. This is the same colour I used to base coat them. Upon reflection, this is probably a little bit too subtle. I might use a slightly lighter colour if I were to do this again. Not a big deal though. Next, I take Model Colour Beige Brown and very lightly paint it onto the upper side of the shovel handles with a fine brush. Not a whole lot to say about this. It's just a simple highlight intended to help convey a sense of the handle being rounded. Next, I use AK Interactive M42 Uniform Green Ochre Khaki again, which is a bit of a mouthful to say. I apply a simple dry brushing of this to the gaiters. It's okay to get this on the pants too. It won't look out of place and it will add a little bit of variation to them. I've gone really subtle with this. The camera didn't seem to pick it up very well. The highlight is there, but maybe it's a little bit too subtle. I also did this with the tank commander's jacket. This is a lot less subtle than the infantry legs, though there is a lot more in the way of ripples and raised bits for the dry brushing to work on on the commander's jacket. Continuing with the M42 Uniform Green Ochre Khaki, I brush it onto all the various parts that were initially base coated in that colour. All of the things like pouches, water bottle covers and webbing. I'm not applying a solid coat here. This is something a little bit like a very controlled and fairly heavy dry brush. The idea is that this colour mostly goes on the raised edges and on the high areas of all these parts. I also applied this to the gaiters in a line down the front of the shin and along the bottom where the gaiter meets the boot. I think this was a little bit more effective than the previous dry brushing highlights while still being kind of subtle, which is what I like. Next, I hit most of the shovel covers and some of the canteens with AK Interactive Canvas Tone. This is an attempt to give a very slight colour variation to these parts so they're not all the same. I don't think it turned out to be all that effective and it almost certainly won't be noticed on the tabletop. If these were in a larger scale, I would add more different colours to the straps and such, but I'm just going to leave these as they are now. There are a couple of things that I haven't even touched yet. The first would be the ammo belts for the MG teams. For these, I just quickly gave them a base coating with Vallejo Game Air Bright Bronze. Of course, being careful to avoid getting this on the hands or gun. I highlight this with Game Air Polished Gold. 
This is pretty simple. I kind of just apply this along one edge of the belt or down the center. It will be darkened down with washes later, which should make it look much better. Next, I used model color black gray to paint all the grenades I could find. The grenades in hands about to be lobbed are obviously the hardest to do, but if you go really slowly and carefully, this isn't super hard, even for someone like me with kind of shaky hands. It might be down to luck, but I didn't mess up any of these. I'm pretty sure these cylindrical things on some of the figures are smoke grenades. I've no idea if this is the correct colour for any kind of grenade, but I don't really care. I'm using it anyway. I also use this colour for binoculars. I'm not going to worry about highlighting these, though if I were, I would probably base them in black and then add the black grey as a highlight. Then, to try and add a little bit of interest to the water bottles, I painted their caps with Vallejo model colour brown violet. I then used model colour USA Olive Drab, mixed with a tiny bit of model air white, and dry brushed the tops of the bazookas and the mortar. This mixture was about 6 parts Olive Drab and 1 part model air white. I wasn't entirely satisfied with the result I got from this, so I went back over it with a tiny bit more white added to the mix. Next, I decided to add some highlighting to the wooden parts of the rifles. For this, I am using Model Air Mud Brown. I wasn't entirely sure if I would like this, but I figured it might be worth trying. This paint is very thin, so it doesn't coat that well, especially considering how lightly I was applying it. This made it work really well for what I was trying to do, though it is a little bit messier than I was hoping for. It didn't show up so well on camera, but it should look pretty good with a wash over it. After this, I figured it was time to touch up all the leathery bits. Unsurprisingly, I used the AK Interactive Red Brown Leather for this. This is obviously all the things like weapon straps, helmet straps, sidearm holsters, and boots. For all these highlights, I'm trying to be neat, but only in the sense that I'm hitting the leather part and not its surroundings. Otherwise, this application is a little bit messy, rather than straight edges of highlight. I think it looks pretty good, and definitely helps bring out these leather parts. I then dry brushed the helmets again using a mixture of about 4 parts model colour brown violet to 1 part buff. I mostly applied this to the helmets with the netting, though not many have it. I also added it around the brims of all the other helmets. Because I'm a numpty, I didn't video myself painting the straps on top of the helmets, which is what I did next. I'm sure you can imagine how that might go though. It was much like painting all the other straps. I then applied undiluted dark tone to the M ammo belts to darken them down. I put this on quite heavily. I don't want to make it too dark, but I also don't want it to be excessively shiny. Then I apply a wash of strong tone all over the figures, including the flesh and weapons. This is diluted a fair bit, though I've forgotten exactly what the ratio was. Probably something like 4 parts water to 1 part strong tone. This will darken down all the colours and provide some shading in all the gaps and recesses. It also causes everything to have a slightly dirty look to it, which seems appropriate for infantry that have been out in the field for who knows how long. I then applied a mix of 50% water to 50% army painter dark tone to the flesh areas. Not really a fleshy colour, but I feel like it helped create a more dirty appearance with darker colouring in the recesses. It works with the layers beneath it to create what I think is a good mix of colours that are nice and dirty, but not too dark. I then applied a thin layer of PVA glue to the bases, being careful not to get the glue on the feet of the models or anywhere other than on the bases. And then I used my shiny new static grass applicator to apply the grass to the bases. This is a mix of a few different sizes and colours of grass, but mostly dead and scorched grass. I really like using a static grass applicator for this. In fact, this video was delayed because my old applicator stopped working. Definitely a very handy tool that can quickly give you nice upstanding grass. Also, I really enjoy the way the bits of static grass fly up and stick to the applicator. It just looks interesting. I then neaten up the rims of the bases using Vallejo Model Air Burnt Umber. I figured this might represent the earth under the grass or something. I think it's a bit nicer and less stark than just using black. To finish these models, I applied AK Interactive Ultra Matte Varnish to dull down all the shiny bits. I also make sure to spray some into the grass to kill the shine there caused by the PVA glue. I'm pretty happy with how these have turned out, though they're not the best ever, and I have definitely spotted things I might do differently were I to start again, mostly making some of the highlights stand out just a tiny bit more. But I think they're okay. A pretty reasonable tabletop standard paint job. Some of you probably already know that I don't particularly enjoy painting 15mm scale infantry, so I've done these relatively quickly. Yes, I know it took a long time, but that's mostly because these kept getting put aside in favour of other things. Actual time spent painting was relatively short. I didn't spend the months since building these models painting them. I'm not quite that slow. 
I think the trick with 15mm scale infantry is knowing how much detail to go into. These things are tiny, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend too much time adding excessive detail that won't be seen beyond arm's length. And I think I got that level of detail right. They do look a bit rubbish up close, but you can see the important details at a reasonable distance and I didn't spend too much time to achieve that. They should look good on the tabletop. For those interested there is a list of all the colours I've used in the painting of these figures in the video description below. As I mentioned before, the Grimball's Beasts box set these infantry figures came in is no longer in production, and has been replaced by the Patton's Eagles box. I kind of wish they had released that when I bought this box just because of the books you get with it. I like books. You can also get this armoured rifle platoon in its own box, UBX-11. It comes with 5 M3 half tracks as well as the infantry figures. In case you don't want the tanks for whatever reason, maybe that box is for you. Okay, so now that I've finished these infantry, which of the Grimball's Beast's models will I be painting next? The other week in Ask a Herbert Erpaderp, I put up a poll asking what Grimball's Beast's vehicles you guys would like to see me paint next. The results of that poll were pretty clearly in favour of the Pershings followed by the Shermans. There wasn't a lot of love for the half-tracks. I was sure the Shermans would win, but that's cool, the Pershings are really cool looking tanks and nice models. And I like them more than the Shermans. I will now put the vote to my patrons to make the final choice between Pershings and Shermans. So if you want to take part in that vote you'll have to become a patron. There's a link in the description or you could click the Patreon logo on screen now. Other bonuses to becoming a patron include getting to see my videos a little bit early and patron only outtakes. Any pledge is certainly appreciated but if you do pledge more than $10 per month I will send you a personalised thank you card. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you liked it go ahead and click the thumbs up button. If you thought it was just dreadful click the thumbs down button. Subscribe if you've not done so already and of course leave any comments, questions or suggestions you have in the comments section below. I'll be back again soon, so until then, happy modelling and thanks for watching. Farewell.